I'll just ask everyone to turn off their videos and unmute themselves during the presentation. Uh, following the presentations, we'll have uh, some time for some Q&A. Um, and uh, okay, with that, um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Green Home NYC uh, Forum. Uh, this is material shortages. Um, for those of you who are new to Green Home, Green Home is a all volunteer nonprofit uh, focused on presenting news and information within the sustainability sphere. Um, and we do that through three main um, arms of the uh, organization. The first is the tours, where we tour um, sustainable buildings and um, such as um, the Sims Recycling Center, for instance. Those happen periodically throughout the year. Um, they've been virtual, but I think uh, very shortly they'll be back in person. Uh, the second one is careers, which is um, typically uh, professionals uh, conversing with one another about their experiences. And it's really kind of like a uh, informational presentation to help people get into um, and, and transition into green careers. Um, and then lastly, the forums, which is what tonight is. Um, uh, and speaking of that, our next forum is going to be on August 18th, and that's going to be on dirty energy around the world. So be sure to check out that. Um, also, please follow us. Um, go on our website, greenhomenyc.org, to sign up for our newsletter. Follow us on social media uh, to keep up with all of our programs and to read our blog as well. Um, Lastly, this meeting is being recorded, so we will have it up on YouTube. And if you know people that maybe missed it or you want to view it again, it'll be uh, on our YouTube channel, Green Home NYC. Um, so up uh, for tonight's um, presentation, um, material shortages. First, we have John Barrows, uh, founder of P3 Building Group and founding partner of Performance Path Solutions. Um, after John Barrows, we are going to see a presentation from Art Taylor, who is the senior, who is a senior project manager at PowerFlex. So um, without further ado, um, I'm going to let John take it away. Um, and uh, John, the floor is yours. Um, actually, before, let me get that uh, presentation up for you. While you're doing that, uh, thank you, Harris. Um, as Harris said, I'm a, I'm a builder. Um, my market's out on the East End. I've been pretty active with the National Association of Home Builders uh, in the green sustainability arena. We uh, I'm past chairman of the Green uh, High Performance Sustainability Committee. Uh, I've worked at various capacities as chairman of uh, task forces on electrification, appraisals, uh, certain things like that. So. Some of the data and stuff that I'm going to be showing you um, today is, is kind of based on uh, some national builders stuff and also uh, statistics from the National Association of Home Builders. So um, what what we have here is I'm starting out the the you probably were aware that there was a huge spike in material prices over the last. Uh, uh, as things kind of started during the pandemic and then really started to hit uh, some high numbers uh, as, as we started working our way out of the pandemic. At one point, lumber prices had driven up the cost of the average home in the US uh, to about a little over $35,000. It's come down the last um, surveys, it's come down about 30,000 uh, added to the cost, which is, kind of translates almost to $10,000 in, in home value. Now, the prices have started and have continued to come down. I, I just saw some data this morning um, that was kind of preliminary, and it's almost back to where it was uh, in late um, 20, or uh, excuse me, early 2020, before things uh, really started to, to go haywire. But the, the point is that the, the higher the prices go and where, where they are at this $30,000 range, it really prices out 
the bottom 25% of uh, potential home buyers, which is a real concern um, in, the, in the new administration because they have a focus on affordable housing. So there's been a joint effort um, at the federal level and then also within our association to try and get these lumber prices down. So uh, Harris, if you want to go to the next slide. So here, here's kind of a couple graphs that, that show a couple different things. Um, when you look at kind of futures and stuff, it's based on a board foot pricing, um, which is a generic kind of unit measurement. A board foot is one inch thick, uh, 12 inches wide and one foot long. So two by fours, two by sixes, things like that can get converted into a board foot. Um, in January of 2021, um, excuse me, in 2020, the futures and composite index had it at about $500 per board foot. Um, but in April, futures had gone up almost three times uh, to approximately 1,500 uh, per board foot. And the recent declines, as I said, you see the, the, the blue graph um, on, the, on the right, the prices have started to come down. And the graph that I saw this morning, it was, it was almost down to that 500 level. But the problem is, is that lumber companies, dealers, distributors, they've all bought at those high prices. So even though um, futures are trending downward and prices are trending downward, there's kind of a lag between where it actually, where it actually hits the market. And the graph I saw this morning uh, actually showed futures starting to trend back up while prices uh, were coming down. So it's, it's a really volatile situation uh, in, in terms of the lumber market. If you wanna to go to the next slide, Harris, please. So to kind of put all this in a broader context, there, there have been spot shortages in regional markets. I know uh, last spring, I went to lumber company, went to get uh, some pressure treated stuff that we use for, for outside construction, you know, decks and stuff. And the lumber company was just nothing, absolutely nothing was there uh, because the mills in the South where the Southern yellow pine, where this comes from, um, they were all shut down because of, uh, of uh, mandated shutdowns and stuff. The, another, another kind of regional thing was the bad weather that Texas experienced late winter um, and all the freezing that they had. It shut down a lot of refineries, a lot of refineries froze up, um, which had an impact on the resin. So the graph that you see there is uh, the, the pricing of OSB board, which is kind of a plywood material, but it has a lot of resins in it. So that shutdown in Texas compounded um, the volatility of, of OSB. Now, one of the things that I build with is uh, SIPS panels, which is an OSB skin on both sides with a foam core. So we've seen prices go up uh, tremendously just in the last six months. And I started buying things uh, for projects that I had kind of buying on futures. And my SIP supplier told me that from March to April, it went up 500%. And I said, you gotta be kidding me. Um, he said, that's nothing. It went up 300% since uh, leading up to that point. So there was a huge increase uh, in the OSB prices. Some of the other areas that we're seeing um, shortages and delays are in appliances, anything that, that could be manufactured overseas and has to be shipped here, uh, especially uh, with China. Now, some of this stuff is kind of a result of the last administration's trade embargoes and things like that. But all these things are, are all kind of compounded and, and kind of interrelated. Um, and so it's kind of, it's very hard to tell where the next thing is gonna come up and, and slap you in the face. Uh, my pool contractor told me that he's having trouble getting plastic pipe now for some of the manifolds that he uses. Um, steel had some spikes and it seems to be uh, continuing to climb, although not as steeply as it had been in the past. Um, as I mentioned before, earlier, products manufactured in foreign countries and shutdowns and shipping, they've all, they've all had an impact. The thing that we're really starting to see an impact uh, just in the last couple of months is in the labor market. Um, there have been a number of theories on that. Part of it is um, some people would prefer to sit home, uh, collect, they could be collecting more money 
than they would be making in, in certain markets. Or there's just kind of a hesitation or reticence uh, to go back to work and get involved in that kind of um, environment where, where um, illness could be spread or something. But there, there's a whole bunch of things happening where uh, I know my plumbing contractor, he, he has had help wanted signs, my electrician, um, more in the specialty trades with really having a hard time finding, um, finding help. Uh, it's been translated into the manufacturing side also. Um, I know a number of SIPs manufacturers that are trying to go to double shift or around the clock shift to meet the demand uh, for their product and they're struggling to fill um, just one shift uh, to meet the demand. Now, kind of a sidebar to that is the transportation industry is hurting too. They don't have enough truck drivers. There's this huge demand uh, for product to get out into the market and we have limited um, availability of transportation. So it's a, it's a number of things that have all kind of uh, worked in conjunction with each other and kind of against each other also to create this, this really um, difficult uh, pricing time the, the kind of good news moving forward is uh, the prices on things got so high that people have kind of pulled back a little bit, which is also, you know, the laws of supply and demand have brought things back down. So um, what we're hearing from the NHB economists is this will continue, but we won't start to really start to see leveling off until mid to late fall. So next slide, please. So some of the solutions that um, I've introduced uh, in my company and I've seen other builders do kind of across the industry, there's been a uh, kind of a resurgence of looking at panelization or factory built housing. Um, I, I tend to refer to that as the systems approach. In other words, how can we bundle systems together uh, to find efficiencies so that we can, we can uh, use less material uh, the, the panelization and factory built stuff, they're very good at waste management, being able to utilize every piece of lumber, or every piece of, of material that goes in. To avoid transportation issues, um, we started looking locally where we could or regionally uh, to source materials, which is a very, um, one of the tenets of green or sustainable practices is to uh, buy local or regional to limit transportation. Um, and a lot of times, you know, they can respond quicker to the market than some of the national suppliers can also. Um, a lot of people have been looking at alternative strategies. Um, as I said, this kind of systems approach, looking at um, other options. I know uh, I took part in a, in a forum where I was talking about uh, building with SIPs. And there was a representative from the steel industry that was talking about um, framing and building with, with steel studs, which in large part are, are recycled uh, materials also. There's also been a push to go to concrete. Now, um, the debate is on, you know, kind of where do you decide how green or how sustainable concrete is? Uh, it's not too bad on the site, but in the manufacturing side of things, um, it's got a pretty big carbon footprint. I think the, the, the biggest thing that we've accomplished uh, is pre-planning. And, and by that, I mean, um, trying to buy the whole job out at one time. If we can, if we can get commitments from our clients, if we can get commitments from our suppliers and then purchase everything ahead of time, we're kind of locking things in. Um, initially going into the, the pandemic and where the, where the building industry started to take off, that was, um, a lot easier than it is now, but the shortages have, have kind of made that pre-planning or buying out ahead of time uh, a little more difficult. Um, from a builder's standpoint, we put escalation clauses now in our contract to kind of protect this, this rapid increase in price. Um, and then finally, a lot of people have, have kind of just simply delayed starting things. Um, so I think that as that pent up delay starts to have an impact or they start to come online, we may start to see kind of a little hiccup in this, um, in this pricing recovery. Uh, so next slide. So to wrap things up, um, 
some of this, I, I thought I would spend just a brief amount of time on uh, kind of where we see things headed in the future, kind of as an outcome of the pandemic and what people uh, are interested in. Um, there's been a, obviously a big increase in the importance and the desire for um, indoor air quality. Uh, and I've had clients approach me on uh, ultraviolet filters, obviously then moving up to a higher nerve rating on filters. Um, but this, this concept of indoor air quality or indoor environmental quality is something more than just indoor air quality, which the indoor air quality can be the filtration, um, the products that you bring into the house, the off-gassing, um, providing proper ventilation. But the indoor environmental quality, what we're, we're starting to see is, is a bigger um, impact or bigger interest in, in like lifestyle practices that uh, impact the indoor environment and, and the quality of that. Such things as, as universal design, um, aging in place, um, apartments for in-laws, uh, along with obviously the indoor air quality. We're also starting to see design start to develop where there's like step off pads or, or decontamination rooms as you're coming in from the garage. Um, total separation in terms of being able to clean things that you're bringing in or to interface with people that are bringing things uh, into your home making, making deliveries. Um, I saw one uh, production builder that was making the in-law apartment have a glass wall uh, on a common wall with the um, with the living space, so that if somebody they could use that if somebody became ill and had to quarantine, they could still have kind of FaceTime, face-to-face -face, um, interaction with people in the household. And then obviously um, the ventilation and all the things that they, that go along with that, uh, along with multifunctional areas, because as we've as we've had to work remotely, uh, there've been various people working in the home need kind of separate space, but you also need space to get away and kind of detach and, and kind of rejuvenate yourself. So the home is, has gone from being a, a, a home that's an investment to being looked at more as kind of a place of refuge, a place that you can, you can go away and just kind of regroup and, and also be, be the workplace. So because of that, um, we're seeing a kind of a, a slide in the change in value or what the perception of the value is. It's, it's not just about the money that you put in the house and, and return on investment. It's kind of like this feeling of the indoor environment quality and, and some of these things that can be brought into the home that, that add value, that the value goes beyond just the monetary side of things. The, uh, to wrap up, I just wanted to bring to your attention this uh, website homeperformancecounts.com. Uh, it was pr uh, put together both by the National Association of Home Builders and also the National Association of Realtors. And it's just a good kind of starting point to see kind of trends that, that are in the industry, uh, kind of how to talk about things, kind of where the interest level is changing. Um, it was also, they uh, worked with a a woman, uh, Suzanne Shelton, who has done a lot of research in uh, green, sustainable practices, not just in uh, home building, but in food service and um, so other service industries, and uh, really has a good handle on what the buyer, or what the consumer uh, is looking for. So, so that's a good resource also to kind of see where things are going and how things have changed um, during the pandemic. So. Uh, that's all I had, and I guess we're going to wait to uh, do questions later, Harris. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we're going to be doing uh, Q&A um, after Art's presentation, so feel free to um, send them in the chat, um, or we can open it up to the floor and you can, you know, ask the question on your own. Um, Okay, up next we have Art. Um, as I mentioned, he's a uh, project manager at PowerFlex. He's gonna be talking about the, the solar industry. Um, so Art, uh, take it away. Yep, good evening, everybody. Um, before we got started here, I 
told John not to steal the show, and then that's what he went ahead and did. Um, but the um, while there are overlaps in in our two industries, we do have a, a different a different uh, uh, a different uh, construction um, aspect to what we do. And I apologize, I don't have a, a presentation for you, so you're going to have to look at me while I talk. Uh, they keep me very busy. Our industry is booming. So I am a senior project manager with PowerFlex. We uh, used to be called Enter Solar, and our motto was business for uh, solar for business. Uh, we have since become PowerFlex, and with that name change, we've now expanded our, our offerings, our product line, in addition to uh, commercial and industrial solar um, for business. We now offer EV charging and uh, um, battery storage. So we offer a full line of renewable energy products to the business world. Uh, I am a project manager overseeing all types of uh, solar installations from rooftops uh, through ground mounts and carports. I tend to specialize in the large scale construction, which is the carports and ground mounts. I've been in uh, solar construction for over 11 years. I've installed projects all over the country uh, for municipalities, uh, uh, educational uh, systems, and just about every type. I've seen every type of installation there is. So in our industry, uh, we use every type of material imaginable. Um, steel is our first big one, and we use steel in every type of installation uh, rooftops, ground mounts, and carports. Of course, the carports and the ground mounts use the greater greater amount of steel, but it's a big component in our in our solar construction. Uh, we've seen an enormous increase in cost for steel. It started during the pandemic, uh, just since January. The steel prices have increased over two hundred percent. Uh, this is very impactful on our 2021 build projects, uh, especially as I noted on the large scale constructs, construction such as carports and ground mounts. Um, the increase in cost from the vendors, the racking and steel vendors quickly trickled down to us and then ultimately to our clients. This increases the overall cost of our projects, which you know is not ideal um, for our uh, electrical side of things, copper prices, we've seen copper escalate 15% just since January, but it's been on a pretty steady incline since March of last year, which is basically when the pandemic took, took hold. Uh, the driving factor in this price increase for wire is that uh, throughout the pandemic, much of the electrical construction industry was able to continue. So basically, and this holds true throughout for these for these uh, price increases is that construction didn't necessarily slow down very much during the pandemic. There was a decrease, but you know, as an industry, we're working outside, we're able to continue building. On the other hand, uh, factories and distributors and transportation were pretty much shut down. So using up the backlog of materials that had already been ordered, once we reach that point where that backlog or, or, or the inventory was no longer available, it took time for the pandemic to kind of loosen its hold and for production to start, start up again. As John mentioned, of course, there are labor shortages. Uh, so we can't even, the industry can't even gear back up properly to handle the backlog of orders. So we're still, we're still looking at, at shortages here and with that come the cost increases as they ramp up with extra hours trying to, to uh, meet the demand. Uh, just going back to steel, for instance, uh, we use several different types of steel in the industry, hot rolled, cold rolled, plate, they all have a different uh, process and a different cost to them. And the, you know, we were already hurt by uh, by tariffs, um, and then the pandemic and transportation issues as well have really hurt us. Um, and there's 
this is not just co a cost issue, it's also a lead time issue. Um, we've seen lead times for steel, for instance, go from sometimes eight to 10 weeks for a project to 21 weeks, so months ahead of time. Um, and, and one of the things we, we see here too is that the um, um, impact is not just on uh, projects that are happening now, but on projects in the future. So in our business, there are, uh, we, we work with clients, for clients. Sometimes they dictate when we can start a project or start to spend money for, for ordering material. Uh, in uh, many cases, we do not get notice to proceed until the client is ready for that. And then we can then order our material. Um, but there's a lot of times where we are responsible for dictating what the timeline for that, for ordering material. And then we are, um, if, if we're not contracted prior to the construction rush and the delays and the, and the cost increases, we're kind of left holding the bag on those costs uh, instead of being able to pass that on to the client. So uh, we are also seeing um, price increases and delays due to illness, um, factories being shut down, construction halting. Uh, we're seeing significant delays on, on transformers, on roofing materials. Right now, we've got a lot of rooftop projects going on with some very big national clients where we're waiting on uh, what's called roof attachments and other roofing materials that, that are necessary, uh, cable tray. Um, and here's an interesting one is something John briefly touched on is plastic or in our business, PVC pipe conduit. So we are looking at these shortages and long lead times because of the freeze experience in Texas last winter that they still have not caught up from. Texas is home to three of the largest resin factories in the country possibly in the world. And they were, you know, they're one of the largest exporters of plastics and it's resin that is the, the main component of those. The freeze which shut down plants led to a global plastic shortage. And we're seeing lead times, especially on our ground mounts and our carports where we use sometimes thousands of yards of PVC conduit, where we are experiencing delays still in trying to get them uh, get them to our sites. And then with the trucking shortage, you're seeing you know, trucks cross country that are unable to meet the demand, uh, slowing us down even more. So we're having our larger projects severely impacted by just even the PVC, never mind the steel and the, and the wire and the copper. Um, so we, we, we see this as a, a current problem that will flatten out. Um, we're seeing, we think we're gonna start flattening out maybe in the late fall. Um, so that as factories ramp back up, as more people go back to work, maybe as a result of, of stimulus um, uh, being phased out or reticence about being in the workplace around other people, we, we're gonna to start to see it flatten out at the very latest once we hit winter. Um, and that's our hope because we don't see we don't see a, a, um, a solution to this other than basically time. Um, and uh, we're also seeing too, and, and I know that it's a controversial subject to talk about, which is you know, climate change or global warming, but we'll just call it weather. Uh, even on transportation with materials coming overseas, um, you know, the Suez Canal incident, which was blocked for, for quite a while and just weather uh, flooding in, in, in uh, Asia and Europe has also really impacted this. So it's not just one component. It wasn't just the, it wasn't just the pandemic that got us into this situation. It's, it's also, uh, we'll call it weather, um, which is a topic for another, another forum, I would say. Uh, but it has definitely had a huge impact. And that is something we think that is not going to uh, go away anytime soon. Um, the pandemic, uh, resonance of on the industry will go away, it will flatten out, but 
the, uh, the impact that the weather has had on, on production and on transportation is something that could be a new normal and you know, definitely has to be looked at very seriously. Um, so you know, as the, the impact, the long-term impact, you know, we, we have to look at carefully, costs are rising. I'm not sure that they're ever going to go down because that doesn't tend to happen. They might flatten out, um, but our entire industry is geared towards uh, renewable energy, green, and just the fact that my company is, uh, and, and it's much bigger on the West Coast right now than the East Coast, but the entire industry is geared towards uh, making our society a little more renewable so that we're not relying as much on on materials and, and uh, uh, fossil fuels that are impacted by either the weather slash climate change or pandemic issues. So EV chargers, electric cars, you know, that's a big deal out on the West Coast. We're hoping to bring it out to the East Coast, but that's a big part and battery storage too, battery backup for our systems, especially for carports and, and uh, our ground mounts, mostly our carports is to get people to you know, move away from the fossil fuels, the, the materials that um, even though we use it in our industry, which is ironic and that's not lost on us, uh, but we feel that the long-term impact of what we're doing uh, is, is going to help with some of these issues as well. Uh, and that's, you know, it's going to take time. It takes time to change people's minds, but we find that businesses, corporations are very, very much on board. There's a very big demand for, for lowering the car carbon footprint um, as when it comes to the corporate sector, to, to big business. And we're seeing that with very large clients all over the country. Um, I'm seeing it here. I, I'm working on the biggest projects we have on in the Northeast uh, with our corporate clients. And they are very, very, uh, I'm actually surprised sometimes at how motivated uh, these companies are to help reduce their their imprint um, and try to encourage their employees to uh, utilize the EV chargers and and, uh, um, and be a part of community renewable energy, community solar in some cases where they get the they get some of the benefits of um, of the addition of renewable energy to the grid, to the electrical grid. Um, so we, we, while we don't see, I don't personally see a short-term solution to this, um, just what we do in general is a good medium to long-term solution. So I'm very comfortable and happy to be contributing to that and trying to, uh, to solve some of these problems. And, and so that when we have a, a pandemic or some other issue that you know, slows production, halts production, hinders transportation, that it's not going to have such an enormous impact on our supply chain. Um, and uh, that's, uh, that's about all I have. Great, thank you. Thank you, Art. Um, on your last point, I definitely agree. The, the more solar, the, more, the less vehicles we have on the road, the you know, the less impact uh, weather or, you know, we should just say really climate change is going to have. So you're definitely in the right industry. I thank you for that. Um, so as I said before, we're going to open up the floor now to uh, Q and A. Um, you could totally send in your message or um, you could unmute yourself and uh, ask uh, yourself, but let's see, we have one uh, in right now from Raul. Um, this one's for John. Um, can you expand on the uh, escalation clause uh, that you're having to insert into your contracts because of rapidly rising material costs? And are you seeing pushback from customers? Um, we're not seeing pushback. Um, they like the idea that something's being benchmarked. Um, what we do is um, the last budget that we give them, we benchmark the date that the price is based on. Um, try and be as transparent as we possibly can. Um, and actually, the, the trend going now, stuff that I priced two months ago, um, they'll be they'll be coming in less than, than what we what we budgeted for. 
Um, so, so, it, so it can work in their in their favor. Um, I found through the years of building homes and working with people that the more transparent I can be about some of these things that can be difficult to understand. Um, the more benefit there is for for both parties. I don't know if that if that answered your question. Um, I mean, with the, the clause, I don't I don't have it off the top of my head, but it, but it basically states the date of the of the project and that these prices are subject uh, to change um, due to volatility uh, in the supply chain. It makes sense to me. Thanks, John. Um, I have a another question for you. Um, curious about your um, opinion on like mass timber construction, mass timber buildings. I know there's some limitations on building codes and they're not super popular in America, but uh, there's a lot of infrastructure in Europe that's built with majority timber. And I, I'm curious uh, of your opinion on that and you know, how sustainable using uh, wood for construction actually is. That um, that we're starting to see more interest. It, it hasn't really gotten a toehold. I couldn't even tell you what the percentage is. I know that in some commercial projects, uh, that's become much more popular. But there there has started to be some interest in in that in the residential market. Um, a lot of a lot of um, Scandinavian or Northern European companies. Uh, are starting to come into uh, wanting to display like the builder show and, and places like that. So um, I think that's that's got some possibility. Um, the cradle to cradle or cradle to grave. I you know I I haven't seen any real studies on on that. It, the timber is a renewable resource. Um, originally. We thought of timber as not being that renewable, um, but in light of some of the things that are going on now, um, I think there, I think there's some potential there. Okay, great, thank you. Um, also, just to clarify uh, for Dana, the point I was making before is it was just that um, the more solar projects that we have successfully uh, installed, the more sustainable buildings, um, the more. EVs we have on the road, or better yet, the getting cars off the road entirely and building more mass transit, mass public transportation, the uh, less effect climate change will have um, on on future weather effects. Um, so I wasn't really tying in solar directly into driving, uh, just to clarify um, that point. Um, let's see. Um, Okay, uh, another question uh, from Earl. Uh, this one's for Art. Um, it's my understanding that the Biden administration recently restricted some specific material for solar PV panels out of China, or perhaps it was a manufacturer from China. Can you add some color to that development and the uh, impact on your developments or your projects rather? That's a good question, Raul. Um, let's just talk about the uh, restrictions and tariffs are already in place. So we already have uh, tariffs on solar modules um, that are coming in from China and, uh, and also on steel, on imported steel. So that affected, um, that affected us a, a great deal. Um, we're hoping that those tariffs are going to end when their uh, expiration date comes up. Recently, you're right, uh, by an administrative yeah, administration did restrict from a region in China, I believe it is, where they felt that um, there was a labor issue where there was some human rights violations. Um, so what that does to us, it does impact us. It does impact us because it limits the amount of vendors we have, the, the different sources we have, and certainly, we understand, I understand, I don't want to be part of anything that is causing human rights violations, but that's my understanding is that that particular component that is part of the PV panels uh, 
was restricted. And I believe it was just from a certain manufacturer or a certain area. I'd have to look into that more deeply. But it wasn't the entire, um, it wasn't the entire country or the, you know, all manufacturers. Cool. Um, thanks for that answer. I have, I have kind of a, another question for you, Art. Um, you mentioned that you didn't really have much um, short-term strategies, um, but you also mentioned that one thing that kept you guys afloat during the beginning of the pandemic was that you had some inventory. Are you guys thinking about perhaps, you know, increasing your inventory? Um, are you prepping for the next pandemic or the next climate change disaster where you can you're like, wow, you know, if we had way more inventory um, on hand, we could last longer if the supply chain shut down. Is that something you guys are thinking of? So good question. When it comes to solar modules, yes. Um, when it comes to steel, and uh, we, we're a developer, so we do not build our projects. We hire contractors to, to come in and build our projects. And a lot of times, you know, it's on them, it's on those contractors to procure those materials. Now we procure transformers, uh, the bigger electrical equipment and things of that nature. And so the answer is that that is a conversation we're going to be having because even our utilities, for instance, here in New Jersey, where I live, PSE&G is having trouble getting transformers and there's a much longer lead time. You know, that's not something we can do anything about, but some of the equipment that we supply, maybe we should think about that. But, you know, now you're talking about a cost of, of material that is built specifically for projects. So we, there's no generic, there's no generic step up transformer we use in the, in the industry. It's built per the specs that are needed for the project. And so it's impossible to stockpile that. So, but when you're talking about, you know, about uh, conduit, okay, yeah, maybe we could get into that, but you know, we're not in the, you know, we're not in that aspect of, of buying material and holding it other than the things we're usually responsible for. Uh, maybe some of our suppliers, maybe some of our contractors, we could talk to about doing that. And I have one, one of my big installers in New Jersey who is doing that on their own. They've started to think, hey, maybe we need to, over or spend a little money to build up some inventory here so that we, we do have everything on hand because our industry is, is, is literally exploding. It's, it's enormously, um, uh, we're, we're, we're incredibly busy right now and we've got future projects coming up and a lot of these installers, they're seeing that and yeah, I think they should think about it, but that's a risk. It's a risk to take to, to, to stockpile inventory uh, you know, for jobs that haven't even been contracted yet. So it's kind of a dicey situation there. But there are ways, yeah, looking at it, there are some things that can be can be um, ordered ahead of time and inventory. Yeah, I, yeah, now that you now that you bring that up, I, I definitely see the difficulties in that and maybe perhaps like ripple effects of all these contractors, all of a sudden almost like hoarding supplies uh, so uh, yeah, maybe that really wouldn't be such a good idea. Um, that, was part of the, that was part of the problem with shortages right, is right. that this spring when, you know, construction started ramping up fully again, that people were over ordering and, and created even a greater shortage, just like the old toilet paper off the shelves during the pandemic. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Um, let's see. I, I have another quick question for you. Um, how was um, how did you see the uh, battery shortage? Like, so, like uh, I know that one of the, the big things for EVs right now are batteries. The materials to make batteries are so expensive. Um, how do you, how do you see that that battery uh, shortage, a battery expense, kind of affecting your um, your battery storage devices? That would be a better question for one of our West Coast project oh, managers, okay. I'm East Coast, and, and that's not as big a product in demand on the East Coast yet. Um, we're starting to see a ramp up, but the West Coast is, is the hub of, um, of battery storage and EV chargers right now. Um, we do now carry those products, and we're starting to see some demand from 
corporate clients for that. Um, there is a big project I'm doing now um, that we added that as a, a late adder, but I have not been privy to the cost increases uh, for the battery. So I, I couldn't answer that with any authority. Gotcha. Okay, great. Um, okay, next question's um, for you, John. Um, are you familiar with Next Energy Windows that transforms normal windows into quasi solar panels? Have you installed any? Um, and uh, what, what's been their performance, if you're familiar with that? Uh, I have I have heard of them, but I have, don't have any any personal experience with them. Um, our clientele, uh, people that buy homes, don't usually. Uh, it's, it's pretty rare that they push the envelope, so it's kind of um, it's kind of us to be be staying with stuff that we know works. Um, the uh, you don't want to really experiment with your with your clients, so to speak. Um, but I, the, the the whole supply uh, products that we're getting are are constantly changing. So it's 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 a challenge for us to make sure we're making a wise decision and uh, doing something that's going to have a positive effect, not a detrimental effect. Um, so, some products look great in the short term, but uh, in the long term, they can kind of come back and, and have unintended consequences. So. All right, gotcha. Yeah, it I seems like uh, pretty experimental stuff, and uh, we wouldn't want to push the the building envelope. Kind of a pun. Thought that was kind of funny, <laughs> as you said. Um, is there uh, anyone else um, that would that has a question? Uh, please uh, feel free to unmute yourself and to start your video, um, kind of get like a conversation or dialogue going, uh, if anything comes to mind. It's a lot easier in person. Um, speaking of which, for future forums coming up um, for next year, they are, they will start to be, you know, going back into person, hopefully soon. So um, definitely keep your eye out for future forums. Um, and uh, okay, I suppose I have one more question for Art, and I think this is a much broader question for solar. I'm not sure, you know, this probably isn't quite your expertise, but the, there's a very specific type of sand for solar panels. It's not just any old sand that, that you know, that, that's needed. Um, is anyone in the industry no, talking about right what happy. this, supply of, of this of these materials um in like 50 years 100 years are, are people thinking that far ahead because i've read some articles that's like you know decades from now we're not thinking that far ahead but like is your company kind of thinking that far ahead and or is it just in the moment there's a boom let's set these projects uh, going that's a good question first of all sand i don't think people realize how many different kinds of sand there are. <laughs> it's, it, when I started learning about sand, it, it's, it's fascinating at the, um, the different uses and restrictions on what kind of sand you can use, even for, even for fill and for, uh, but um, the, the question is a good one and doesn't just relate to sand, but all the things that we use to build modules and anything else we use is, what are we looking at here as far as recyclability? Um, and using limited resources. If we're using fossil fuel type resources or, or you know, natural resources, how, how do we differ from that industry that we're working so hard to kind of replace with renewable energy? Um, the answer is that the industry itself talks about those things. My company has not yet gotten into that internally. Um, but we're all cognizant of it. None of us wants to be uh, depleting resources or adding um, adding materials to that that aren't recyclable, basically. So yeah, that's an issue, and it's one that you know we, we have our conference, our, our big industry wide conference coming up in New Orleans in September. And that's sure to be part of the discussion. Is is what what we're using and and how it can be recycled and or replaced or 
you know, the, the technology is always evolving. Are we going to move away from using sand? Is there, is there a, an artificial uh, way to go about this? You know, but even that requires natural resources to, to, to get to the point. So it's a good question. It's one for the industry in general and definitely mm -hmm. something we're going to be watching. Yeah. Yeah. I saw an article recently about, um, you know, you know, the Biden administration is definitely making some headway in, in their own Green New Deal. But if the if we went full steam ahead with the Green New Deal um, and really ramped up uh, all the construction of wind energy and solar panels and like we would be increasing the mineral mines and the exploitation around the world at, at drastic levels that would have a lot of uh, unintended consequences. So there's definitely a balance in there somewhere. Um, but yeah, it, I mean, at the end of the day, it is non-renewable resources to make renewable energy. So there's, there's limitations there and I'm sure we'll feel those effects in the coming decades. Balance, um, not to balance, be a, is, not the, to be a balance is the key. Balance is the key word there. We have to yeah. strike a balance. Um, the good part being that once something is renewable, you know, it has a long lifetime of being renewable. So it might reduce the resources we're using. But it's definitely a. None of us want to be hypocrites, right? We we want to be doing the right thing, but we have to find the balance to do that. Precisely. Yeah. Um, well, that's that's it for my list of questions. Uh, oh, okay, we got one more. Um, there's another one for Art. Uh, Art, have you been involved in the decommission of solar panels uh, that have either reached their end of life or are not performing as well as expected? Do those panels end up in a landfill? I hear there are tens of thousands of panels already being decommissioned. Yeah, that's a really good question. I was also thinking about that as well. Yeah, you guys are hitting me with the hard ones. I like it. So I'm not personally involved in the decommissioning of solar panels. We do decommission systems, meaning we dismantle them either to install a more updated system with more efficient modules. Um, what I've been hearing is that the vast majority of the material involved in modules is recyclable. Um, and you know, I'm sure not all of it. Um, honestly, I do not know how many actually end up in landfills. I'm sure there's a very responsible uh, back end to this that I would have to look into myself. I, I'm actually curious about that, but my company is not involved in that end of, of disposing or recycling them. I do know for a fact that there are companies in some of the states we work in that go around and pick up uh, damaged, destroyed, or decommissioned modules for the purpose of recycling them. I hope that every company that's in my industry is responsible about that, but I, I don't know as much about it as I should because I'm so busy on the other end building, I, I, I'm not involved in that. Yeah, I mean, it really all does come, come down to the classic saying, reduce, reuse, recycle. People, you know, the best next thing of building something to make sustainable energy is just reducing your energy consumption in the first place, um, and that it starts, applies. It starts, to, it starts there, and then and then yeah. finding that balance point. Yeah, exactly. Raul, uh, thanks so much for for the great questions. If no one else has any other questions, um, uh, we can pretty much end the forum. Uh, last chance, anyone? Going once, going twice. Okay. Well, um, in that case, I. I uh, really want to thank John and Art for giving us their time today and their excellent presentations. I hope everyone uh, learned some stuff about uh, material shortages, uh, the trends lately, um, future ways of, of preventing the mess uh, that has been the last year. Um, keep an eye out for our next forum uh, in August, as well as the career events and the, uh, the next tour coming up. Visit our website, greenhomemic.org to learn more. Um, all right, well, thanks everyone and uh, have a good night. Goodbye.